Now, real estate to me, of everything that I do, real estate is the least risky thing that I do. As long as I have time and as long as I don't over leverage, the only people that lose their real estate are over leveraged. They, they over leverage or they don't have time. They have a partner, meaning it could be a bank or equity that's got a gun to their head saying, you have to sell right now. The commercial real estate market is facing a series of unprecedented challenges. Remote work is leaving office buildings empty. The acceleration of online shopping has retailers scrambling for an edge and hotels have yet to truly heal from the pandemic. Some investors are bearish, others are bullish. It all depends on your risk tolerance and how long you plan to be in the game. I'm Beth Moorcraft, a reporter with MoneyWise, and today I'm delighted to welcome real estate investing expert Grant Cardone, CEO of Cardone Enterprises, Cardone Capital, and founder of the 10X Movement, who's going to help us make sense of it all. Grant, welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to uh, great to have you. So, so Grant, how would you define the state of commercial real estate market today? Well, you know, all real estate. Uh, including residential, multifamily, office, hotels. For the most part, it is, if you look back over hundreds of years, it's very stable, meaning the the investors all pretty much agree about what the value of that real estate is over long periods of time. There's only a couple of times where that changes. And, and those couples of times, over hundreds of years, 2008, uh, including this moment right now, even during the pandemic, uh, late 1995, during the internet bust, 1970s, they all have one thing in common. That was the credit market. Real estate is very much tied its value to whether or not you can acquire debt. The banking system is clearly very fragile right now. The Fed, for whatever reason, uh, which I'm not uh either optimistic for, supportive of. Uh, Jerome Powell has caused so much damage to the real estate market, to residential housing, to the hotel market, to multifamily and to office. This is not just about supply and demand anymore. It's not just about remote office. It's not that Amazon's gonna kill retail. The fact is when you take interest rates, unprecedented raises in interest rates, Unnecessarily, by the way, okay, an over uh, over action of the Fed to somehow control this thing called inflation, which was caused by a supply problem. It was not caused just by low interest rates. Had we had low interest rates and plenty of supply moving out of the system, uh, all that supply would have been consumed by now, and it would not be showing up in the marketplace in stores, um, uh, creating the problems that it has. So. It's fragile right now, but this is the moment. This, these are the opportunities, okay, where people can actually make real big money in real estate. I wrote yesterday on my Twitter account that the real estate correction is now fully in place. So this is a great opportunity for buyers. It is a terrible time to be a seller. Mm -hmm. Well, you've just kind of uh, already answered my next question, but I wanted to get sort of where you stand at the moment. So do you say that you remain bullish on commercial real estate? Yes, because I'm a, I'm a long-term investor. Like I, I'm not, I invest for generations. So the real estate that we buy at Cardone Capital, we have 12,000 apartments. The locations are irreplaceable. They, uh, they're in markets where we have positive job migration. When I buy something in 2023, I'm, I'm thinking about it, its value in 2033 and 2043 and 2053. If I never sold any of this real estate, it wouldn't bother me. I want the cash flow, the tax write-offs. It's a simple business. It's not complicated. It has created tremendous amounts of wealth for hundreds and hundreds of years. It cannot be easily replaced by cryptocurrencies or changes in governments or even technology advances. AI cannot replace where you live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, 12,000 multifamily properties what makes that such an attractive investment? And why have you specialized and focused on that through your career? Because it's simple for me. Like I own a number of businesses. Uh, I, I basically take, I reinvest in all my companies. Uh, anything that's left over, I throw into this thing called multifamily real estate. I believe that people will always need a place to live. Um, I think most people believe that. I got to live someplace. 
Do I need to buy a home? That's been the American dream for years. Jerome Powell, who I believe is an extension of the the Anthony Fauci. You know, COVID was invisible and so is inflation. And um, both of these are damaging. Both of these initiatives uh, are damaging poor people and the middle class. They're not damaged. They're not hurting rich people. Rich people are getting richer. Uh, rich people want interest rates that are high because they have money to earn interest on. And poor people need interest rates. Poor people need a low rate of interest uh, on a home. They can't afford a seven and three quarters percent interest rate to buy a house. It just doesn't make any sense. So the guy, the guy and the gal, the couple that can't now buy a home is forced to be a renter. Uh, affordable housing is completely non-existent. It's, it is totally an oxymoron. It is only used by government officials trying to win the votes of other people saying we're going to have affordable housing. There's no such thing as affordable housing. It is completely impossible to build housing that is affordable today. So if you can't do those things, then you're going to be a renter. Uh, I believe that America will, will go the way of Europe and most of South America, where most people rent uh, are what they call let in Europe, uh, their properties. They won't own them and they'll call them their home, uh, but they won't, they'll never own them. They'll rent them. And so I want to be that landlord that takes care of the tenant, takes care of the property. There's so many, so many advantages to real estate over the other spaces. Office is definitely a winner. Apartments are a winner over office. You got to have a business. You got to have a good economy. Uh, the hotel business depends on discretionary income. Uh, retail depends on I got to go there and shop and trade and I have the risk of Amazon disrupting that space. But apartments, a thousand square feet, two thousand dollars a month, got a nice swimming pool and a theater and security. If it's a nice property, people will find value in that uh, and want to be close to their jobs. Mm -hmm. That's interesting what you say about Europe, because that's definitely a trend that I've seen over there as well. Um, and it's interesting coming here to North America, where there's still that major dream of home ownership and people chase after that. Um, I think you actually did a, a tweet or something uh, recently about kind of people investing in homes and why that's actually a bad decision to make kind of early on in your, I guess, uh, young adult life. Can you kind of dive into that a bit more? Yeah, so, what yeah, so look, I, and I get a lot of hate about this thing. I, I don't know why this, this idea of owning a home is such a treasured fantasy for people because that's all it is. It's a fantasy. I, I own homes. I, I know what they cost to own them. Uh, as a young entrepreneur getting started at 28 years old and I was starting my business, I went and bought a house. Mm -hmm. Uh, because some financial planner said I should own my own home. My dad even believed that. He's like, you should own your own home. No, I should have owned my own business. A business will produce more income than your house. Notice that I, I, it's crazy. I wouldn't take a loan to grow my business, to grow my marketing, to hire employees, to buy machinery, to expand my brand. I would not borrow money to do that. And knowing it would produce income, but I borrowed money. Not a short-term loan, a 30-year loan at 28 years old, to own a house because I thought I deserved the same place to live in. Mm -hmm. Now, now if I look, go back in retrospect, I'm like, what, what was I thinking about? My, my business didn't care if I owned the house. My customers didn't care. My marketing and branding didn't care where I lived. They didn't even know where I lived. So I, you know, the point, the first point is when you're on the come up and you're trying to build a life and, 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 and create wealth, a home would not be the thing that you would think that that would make me better at my career. That's going to get me a promotion. Uh, I'm going to get a bonus because I bought a house. It, it, it's, it's completely, th th this is a manufactured concept by banks. Banks created this idea and government officials created this idea to trap people and build a middle class. And this worked extremely successfully in America. I mean, we, we, we have the, the most vibrant middle class in the world. And while it might seem good compared to somebody that lives in a third world country, it's still a trap. So uh, the second part of that is a home is not a good investment. There's no, under no scenario, if you go back and study the last 50 to 100 years, that 
If you compare a home investment to the S&P 500, to any ETF, or to investing in commercial real estate, or gold, or Bitcoin, or any of the other investment classes, a home is a terrible investment. You know, everybody looks at Beth and Beth and to, they look at, oh, I paid 100 and I sold it for 200. Yeah, but you forgot about the property taxes for 20 years. You forgot about the interest rate of 7% for 20 years. You forgot about the maintenance, the upkeep, the problems, the situations, and the fact that you lost your mobility for those 20 years. It's a, it's a lot to take in as someone who's <laughs> considering that at the moment. It's a, definitely something to think about. But if you, if you look at Elon or Steve Jobs or Warren Buffett, and ask them how they got wealthy, none of them mentioned their house. Mm -hmm. Yep. Elon doesn't even own a home today. Interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> Warren uh, owns one home and Steve Jobs owned one home. Isn't Warren's home the same he's had for same many house. years that he bought? Same. Yeah. Exactly. He's got all his money in investment vehicles that can pay him. Mm -hmm. The other thing about a house is a house is never going to pay you. You're going to pay the house and you keep paying the house. And that's good for the local wherever you live. If you if you grew up in Houston, Texas, that's great for Houston because now you got to pay the property taxes. Now they can depend on your tax dollars. Now they can depend on you to go to work every day. Now, hopefully you'll go vote, but you're stuck in one location. What happens if Houston becomes the next Detroit? OK, mm -hmm. there was a time when Detroit real estate was great today. Not so great and probably will never be great again. Yeah. Interesting. So one other sort of point I wanted to raise on the multifamily side of things, um, I read a few reports recently that suggest that student accommodation or student multi um, housing uh, is a, a potential bright spot for commercial real estate investors, um, with the idea being that students are always going to go to school regardless of economic fluctuation. Um, what are your thoughts on that as a potential go to area? Well, I have not read that particular article. Um, but I do know there's some positive news about student. I'm not one person that would agree with that. I would not I would not invest a dollar in student housing. And the reason I wouldn't is because um, I, I believe that our student college system is broken. It is completely unnecessary. Uh, it is overpriced. Inflation wise, it is the most inflated single commodity on planet Earth today. And it's because the money was free. The government says you have to go to college. Not true anymore. OK, AI is going to just AI, except for the top, maybe 10 or 12 schools in America, it is going to completely tilt colleges, universities, tuitions, five years of my life being spent in a classroom. Uh, the idea that I would even need to travel to a room to study a course today is so, to me, obsolete. Mm -hmm. and antiquated, um, not to mention it costs $45,000 times four years or five years. And again, we're sold on this idea. You got to go to college. You got to get a higher degree. You got to get the, you know, better education. Then you're going to get a great job. It's not true. You, you, have, you have teenagers making hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars today on the internet. Uh, uh, my, my, my brother's, my brother's, school sent him a an agreement that his kids would not use AI to answer questions. The same day he got the notice, my kids are homeschooled, I hired a, a tutor to teach my kids how to use AI. So I wouldn't invest in student housing because I don't know why anybody would ever go to a college in the future. I don't mean today, tomorrow, but I mean in the next five to 10 years, I think that that, that, that gets uh, disrupted. So let's just stick on AI for for a second. Um, how do you see? Obviously, you're interested in it. Interested in it. Um, looking at it, how do you see that kind of perhaps change in the ballpark for real estate investors? Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't really considered how it changes uh, the investor piece. Um, I do think about how it changes our marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, writing scripts, writing ads, writing copy. Uh, we're already using it a great deal at my company. We're, we're big marketers. Uh, it, you know, if you search my name on the internet, you'll see that uh, we we do it. We make a great attempt at marketing to the to the to the public, um, and we've done a decent job at it. So AI. I mean, I took a video that I made while I was in Europe recently, 
fed it to AI in under 25 minutes without an editor, it completely chopped the entire 30 minute video into 10 pieces, re-edited it, put emojis on it, added sound. It was like, oh my God, I just, it literally did the work of an entire department. So now how does that relate to real estate investing? I'm not sure I, I have figured that out yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll uh, it will come at us in the next few years. So, yeah, I mean, look, if you can ask it a question, which is something that people are very, mo- most people that I meet are very weak on good questions. The prompter, how can I ask a really good question to get a great answer? Mm-hmm. And to the degree that you can ask it great questions, like, uh, can you tell me, you know, what are the best ten markets? I don't know that AI. You know, if I do it right now, I wonder what answer they're going to give me. I'll write it in here right now. What What are the 10 best markets? I bet it's going to tell me it doesn't have data on markets yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at some point in the future, it will. Yeah. I'll, I'll find out right now. Yeah. <laughs> what are the 10 best markets for investing in rental real estate in America? And I'm using uh, AI Smith right here for this. The best markets for investing in rental real estate in America can vary depending on factors such as population growth, job opportunities, rental demand, affordability, and potential rental income. Austin, Texas. Actually, Austin, Texas is one of the worst markets to be in right now. All the markets in America is probably the most overbuilt. See, this is the list they're giving me. Yep. Austin's number one. Dallas also. Dallas, it's got Austin, Dallas, and Nashville. Those and Atlanta. Those four markets are all on the top five list of most overbuilt markets. So AI may be picking up something from some past something uh, and not being current. Real estate is a very fluid thing. Uh, So it gave me basically Austin, Dallas, Nashville, Atlanta, Raleigh, Phoenix, Tampa, Denver, Charlotte, Seattle. I wouldn't touch Seattle with anybody's money. It's interesting. It's like you need to understand yeah, you need the expertise behind that to understand the sources and be able to kind of come out with your own, yeah. um, you know, understanding. So, yeah, interesting. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, nice little look. practical. Yeah, another thing I wanted to ask you about, kind of moving into some of your decisions that you've made throughout your career. Um, you often tweet about taking risks and pushing through struggles and fears and challenges. And you know, at the moment, the real estate market is fairly challenging, um, especially for people with perhaps a bit less expertise. What would you say is, you know, the biggest risk that you've taken in your career? Oh my gosh, I've taken so many risks. Like, um, <laughs> Well, any memorable ones? I, I sold out a stadium, 30, 35,000 people in a stadium. I, I spent $10 million to, to rent the Marlins, uh, Miami Marlins Stadium. And, and, and the, the 10 million wasn't a big risk. The risk was, could I fill it up? Mm-hmm. I had to put 35,000 people in seats for three days during the Super Bowl. Super Bowl was in Atlanta. We were in Miami. So uh, that was a major risk because if I didn't do it, it would look terrible. I did uh, uh, Discovery Channel documented me taking away my name uh, on a show called Undercover Billionaire, where they threw me in a town I'd never been, Pueblo, Colorado. I couldn't use my name. I couldn't use my credit cards. I couldn't call my friends. I couldn't use social media and I had to build a million dollar business. That was a major risk uh, because if I didn't, if I didn't pull it off, I'm going to look like an idiot. And, you know, here I am, Mr. 10 X, Mr. Businessman, you can do it. Anybody can do it. You know, uh, now I got to prove it and have it documented. So those, those are big risks. Now, real estate to me of everything that I do, real estate is the least risky thing that I do. As long as I have time and as long as I don't over leverage, the only people that lose their real estate are over leveraged. They they over leverage or they don't have time. They have a partner, meaning it could be a bank or equity that's got a gun to their head saying you have to sell right now. You never want to be in a position like that in real estate because with real estate, it's not a liquid asset. Right. So if I'm if I'm forced to sell. Like I wouldn't sell any of my real estate today under any condition because I know I cannot get a fair price today. And the reason I can't get a fair price has nothing to do with the real estate. It only has something to do with the debt market. When banks are fragile, real estate prices go down. When banks are are stable, real estate is going to be fairly valued 
and it's going to cash flow and it's going to provide you with write offs. And it's, it's a very it's almost a passive business. I, I write a check. I buy the property and I sit and wait for the values to go up over time. So um, of everything that I do in my life, including my kids, my marriage, my other businesses, real estate is the easiest, safest thing as long as I have time and as long as I don't take out too much debt. Yeah. You mentioned there that it's like a passive business. Um, you've you've done a lot of social media and posts and blogs, et cetera, kind of talking about cash flow, generating income, et cetera. Um, would you say that cash flow is still king uh, in today's kind of economic environment? Cash flow is the king, the queen, and the entire court. Okay, it is the holy grail because cash flow allows you to to weather storms and problems. Uh, in two thousand eight, when when uh, that 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 was, by the way, a financial crisis. It was not a housing crisis. It was first the financial crisis, and then it it rolled over into loans that were due on homes, and people couldn't make their notes. So again, a, a financial crisis. We're in a financial crisis right now. Nobody's telling us. We had three major bank failures. One was the largest single bank failure in the history of the United States. The other one was Credit Suisse, which is a 147-year-old company or something. And we acted like it's nothing. People shuff it off like, oh, no big deal. Oh, yeah, it is a big deal. And the other banks are in trouble as well. We have 4,700 banks in America mostly regional banks. We have five major super banks that are too big to fail. The whole, they would drag the entire planet down with them. And um, as long as I have cash flow, nobody's going to fool with my real estate. <laughs> so it, during COVID, I had cash flow. During 2008, 9, and 10, when, the, when property values plummeted 30 and 40%, I still had cash flow. I wasn't a seller of my real estate. Uh, right now, we've had a, there's probably a market adjustment going on in real estate right now. An office is probably 40 or 50%, just disastrous. Uh, retail, they're probably, they're probably one of the better performing, but people are going to talk negative about it. Uh, a multifamily, it's doing great, but you have a lot of people Bethan that took loans out two years ago, and those loans are due today. Today, or they took loans out in 2020. They're due right now. They had a three-year loan is due, yeah. and they thought the economy was going to keep going. And when that loan's due now, they took a three percent loan that is now seven and a half percent, and the deal doesn't work because they use three percent math. So I'm going to buy that guy's real estate. Mm -hmm. we, we are aggressive buyers of real estate that is well located that is already stabilized and that three has cash flow and cash flow for me means above the expenses of the operations and covers the debt. So if I have cash flow, nobody can get me out of my property. Well, why would they? The banks don't want the properties back, right? They, they want to do loans. They make money. Otherwise they, they would be real estate investors. So, and also I'll just tell everybody this, like, Real estate is a much safer investment than having money at a bank. Banks are extremely, extremely risky businesses. Uh, you know, so people in America think they're all safe and they think their money's safe there. But the truth is, you, they don't even pay you. They pay you nothing. Uh, it can't appreciate in value. The money's being depreciated as it's printed. It's going down in value. And people save their money because Dave Ramsey said, save your money, save your money. You need three months of savings. No, what you need is cash flow forever. Because if you have cash flow, you don't need savings. Savings are spent. Okay. Cash flow can be used. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'd like to round out this conversation now, if you don't mind, with uh, some tips. What advice can you share for everyday retail investors who are at the start of this journey and looking to get into commercial real estate? Okay. Yes. Great, great question. Uh, number one, do not look at small deals. OK, uh, I would have a goal to find a deal. One de one unit, two units, four units, eight units. They're, they're small deals, meaning meaning. Their work. OK, it's easier to buy a bigger deal than it is to buy a smaller deal. I know how hard this is to consider. Oh, I don't have the money. I don't have the debt. Great deals will always find debt and they will always find equity. 
The hardest part of real estate is the deal. It's not the debt and it's not the equity. It's not the management. It's not selling it. It's not keeping it full. It's finding the right deal. The right deal will stay full. The right deal will always find debt. The right deal will always find investors. So <clears throat> number one, don't try to do bigger deals. Okay. Number two, I would look for 32 units or bigger. That would be my criteria. And I would look for units where the rent is $200 lower than it should be in the marketplace. This is the exact math I would use looking for a deal. Because what happens to new real estate investors, they walk out their front door and they just look at real estate and it all looks the same. And I did that. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go buy this unit over here. It's a good deal. And then I went and bought a second unit. It was a good deal. The problem is they were two units, two tenants, one moves out, I'm 50% vacant and they don't cash flow. My third deal, my third deal was 48 units. It was easier for me to buy 48 units than it was for me to buy the first two single units. It cash flowed better. It was a better loan. Okay. And I made $5 million on that deal. Those two single units I bought, I never made more than 30 or $40,000. Now, 30 or $40,000 seems like a lot of money, but the truth is, if you need to make 30 or $40,000, you should just get another job. Real estate is about how do I create wealth? Mm -hmm. So I would tell people look for 32 units. If you could find a property that is being rented for $800 a month and you know the rent should be a thousand, perfect. Uh, those deals are available right now all over the country. I don't care. You go from Indiana to Los Angeles to, to Miami. You can go to any city, Nashville, Austin, Dallas, anywhere you want. You can find that deal in the marketplace. Uh, and the last thing I would tell you is when you buy something, you, you have partners on the deal. Quit trying to buy it with just your money. Real estate is a partnership game. You're going to have. A lender, that's your major partner, okay? He's probably going to give you that lender, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac. It's probably going to be 65 to 75% of the deal will be done because of your lender. The other 25 or 30% is friends, family, and your money. And bringing on friends and family is not problematic the way your friends and family tell you it is. This is little people. Oh, don't get investors. They're going to be a problem. OK, you're going to have problems if you don't get investors. I have 13,000 investors at Cardone Capital. We've raised a billion dollars from 13,000 people on social media with no advertising. I don't get my money. It never comes from the big banks, JP Morgan, sovereign funds, pension funds. I don't take any of their money. I've had problems out of 13,000 people. I've had problems with one, two, three, three investors out of 13,000. So, uh, but it's allowed me to build a multi-billion dollar real estate portfolio that I could not have done without me, without, without the investors. So that's what, and, and I would tell, last thing I would tell you, stay in your market, stay where you are. If you can't stay where you are, maybe you're in California right now, you're up in the uh, Northwest uh, you're up in Oakland or San Francisco. I would not touch that marketplace right now. I would leave markets alone where the government uh, encourages tenants not to pay rent. New York, New Jersey, Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Los Angeles, uh, probably Seattle, Portland. I'd leave those markets alone right now until they get back to saying, hey, you need to pay your rent. Um, and so I'd be very careful about the market, but I would use, I would, I would look at gathering money together and not going alone in a deal. That leads nicely into another thing I wanted to ask in terms of how people can, um, I mean, what you recommend in terms of financing real estate investment deals, especially if, you know, I'm at the start of the journey and I have limited capital. Um, so I guess it's partly yeah. this, this sort of group method that you've mentioned, but yeah. do you have any, any other sort of uh, tips? Well, that, that's the beautiful part of it, okay? First, find the right deal. The right deal will always find the debt. So let's say the deal's, I'm just going to use a number, $10 million. You're like, $10 million? There's no way I can do that. Well, if you don't think you can do that, you're never going to look for that. How do you know there's not somebody out there that would actually give you a loan for $10 million? Because somebody will give you a loan for $10 million. Also, a new buyer, okay, a brand new buyer, never done a deal before, 
needs to understand that on a $10 million loan, this isn't like a $10 million house. On a $10 million house, they're going to give you a loan based on your credit history and your credit score. When you're buying a $10 million apartment building, they're not going to even look at your credit score. They're not going to even look at your credit history. What they're looking at is the ability of that property to pay the debt. Okay. You probably won't, the individual probably won't even sign on that loan as recourse, meaning you're responsible for the loan because you're not. The property itself is responsible for the debt. And this is what people confuse real estate. I know a guy that couldn't get approved to buy a house that got approved to buy a $10 million apartment building. Now he's got cash flow coming in. Okay. So, number one, when you find the right property, then your second thing you're going to do is you're going to find the lender. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, maybe Bank of America. It wouldn't be somebody I would go to. But Fannie Mae says, we'll give you $6.5 million on that deal. But you need to have a management company collecting your rents because we don't think you're experienced enough. Okay, good. I can do that. Now, I need to go raise $3.5 million. Maybe I have $35,000 of the three point five, million, and then I need to go raise the, the, the rest from, from other people. There's plenty of people out there that don't want their money in the bank anymore. And they want to be in real estate, the doctor, the lawyer, your dad, your mom, your brother, your sister. They want to be in real estate, but they don't want to collect the rents. They don't want to handle the tenants. They don't want to do the toilets. They don't want to handle termites, but they love real estate. Nobody's presented them with an opportunity. So I've got one final question for you just to round this out. Okay. Um, I'm going to use one of your phrases. So say I've managed to buy or get into a deal that has that 32 apartment um uh, complex. How do I then 10x my portfolio in a few quick steps? Well, 10x is not a not a not a quick thing. And, and then just so everybody knows, I wrote a book called the 10x rule. I have never 10x any of my targets, even though that is my goal, right? If I'm if I if I have made a million dollars, my next target is going to be 10 million. It's just a, it's just an arbitrary idea to have me start thinking in terms of the actions, contacts, and people. So like I own 12,000 apartments right now. So my next target is what? 120,000 apartments. Mm -hmm. Now, now I can't do that tomorrow. I, I don't have, number one, I can't, I don't have the supply. I don't have enough properties to buy. I don't have enough sellers to sell me 120,000 units. Then I have a money problem. I don't have the money to do it. I haven't raised enough money to do it. I don't, and I don't have a debt. I don't have the debt. So I have those three problems. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking at how do I start building this portfolio? Now, if a person owns a single family home and they go from one home to 32 units, they actually just 32 x mm -hmm. their real estate holdings. In many cases, they will have 10,000 X their cash flow, passive cash flow, because they didn't have any. So now once I get 32 units, my next target is going to be 320. Okay, how do I start doing, how do I go do eight or nine or 10 of these deals? Anybody can do this, by the way. I started with no money, Beth, and I started with, I had, my first deal was $3,000. My second deal was no money. My third deal was 350. I put had to put $350,000 down. And I raised most of the 350,000 from people I knew that did not want to be invested in real estate, but they were willing to give me a short-term loan. That's great. There's uh, lots to take in there. Um, perhaps I'll go and start researching some 32 apartment <laughs> lots. Where do but, you live? Yeah. What city you live in? I'm in Toronto. Okay. See, the, it's a little harder to find up there because you guys don't have the you don't have the availability of inventory. You, you typically, what happens mm -hmm. in Toronto is y'all turn everything into condos. Yeah, it's all going up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a great market to be in if you can find uh, the asset. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll keep my eyes peeled. Um, there you go. If I can ever do anything to help you, I'm happy to. <laughs> Brill, thank you. Um, well, Grant, thank you so much uh, for chatting with us today. Got loads of great takeaways there. So I um, very appreciate your time. And it was great having you on the show.